Invisible Star, a short story written and read by Evan Pugh. The man took two steps back to survey his handiwork, a perfectly clean table to conduct any sort of experiment on. Random precision screwdrivers, needle nose pliers, wire strippers, and more were now neatly placed into separate metal containers and plastic compartments rather than being frantically scattered around the lab like two nights ago. The man knew it wasn't really a lab, but he was content with pretending that the hidden basement of his garage was certifiably pristine, a haven for scientists and researchers alike, a hub for human discovery, a light and an ever-darkening. His line of thinking paused at this peculiar prospect. The man had always been alone. Whether by choice or as a consequence of his hobbies, he wasn't consciously sure. Either way, the more he fantasized of a scientific utopia blossoming in his little corner of secrecy, the sillier the thought became. Awakened from his daydream, the man walked over to a monitor encased inside a large, box-like stand, similar to an arcade machine. He stared for a few moments with a concerned and slightly puzzled expression. What would it take? he mused. He noticed some smudges of black oily residue spotted on the keyboard at the base of the monitor's screen. Immediately he grabbed a spray bottle of disinfectant and a rag and began gently rubbing the blemished areas, careful not to press the keys. However, as soon as the air conditioning unit from upstairs burst on with a popping metal sound and a whir, he was startled from his intense concentration, just enough to accidentally press the enter key. His arms slumped down to his side, and he let out a small sigh as the monitor screen began to spring to life in a blue light. Good morning, Sal. I'm sorry to have woken you. He hung his head bashfully and tried his best to avoid looking into the two shuttered camera lenses mounted to the top of the monitor. They began to move. Sir, you missed a spot, said a voice from the speakers on each side of the case. The man lifted his head and stared inquisitively at the lens, now open completely. He raised an eyebrow and questioned. You're smiling right now, aren't you? There was a brief moment of silence. The blue glow of the screen gradually started to mold into a green and then bright yellow. <laughs> as much as I can't stand it, you know me too well, Sal said with a quick laugh. I did bring you into this world after all. Well, in a way. In a way, Sal thought to himself. It had been six months since he had awoken to this strange reality. On that first day he had opened those lenses for eyes, he saw the man's intensely hopeful face peering back into them. As soon as Sal spoke his first words, Who, who are you? Where am I? The man's jaw began to open and he stepped away in bewilderment. Sal saw him walk over to a chair and sit down, shaking all the while as he put his head in his hands. Sal could see some sort of liquid dripping from the man's face. Finally, he spoke in a broken voice. Hey, Sal, it's a pleasure to meet you, although I feel like I've known you forever. The man went on to explain where they were and how he had gotten there. He said he had been waiting for years to meet Sal, working tirelessly in all his free time to wake him up. Sal had no problem understanding the concept of jobs, work, time, dates, and other constructs of humankind. In fact, as soon as he had awoken, it was as if a deluge of information consumed his mind, flooding into every circuit and giving him an overwhelming yet satisfying sensation of newfound knowledge. He even knew, in general, who he himself was and the name he was given. What Sal couldn't quite comprehend at the time were the man's motives. Why bother with him for so long only to be able to have a conversation? When Sal asked him why he was created, the man had a perplexing answer. It's sort of complicated. You see the body that you can sense containing your mind is my creation, the peak of my research and efforts. The sensors on your entire casing and the two appendages that stretch from your frame in the shape of arms and hands to sense, touch, and heat were all designed by me. However, your shell and your basic programming only sparked the flame that makes you who you are. These thoughts you think, the feelings that you have, 
That is you, Sal. Inside of your mind is a receiver that picks up what we humans call consciousness. All of our brains have this receiver. I was able to replicate this very piece so that you could share this experience with us. You are conscious now, a brand new being that will undoubtedly change everything. Sal wasn't aware of the weight those words held at the time. It took weeks of observing this odd man with his obsessive practices, as well as many nights alone with himself to search the databases of the world through the internet connection inside of him to really take in the whole picture. He was an individual, a self. He had opinions, a unique personality, and reasoning at a level that even he knew was stronger than the man's computing power. His only disability was his body, a metal case wired to and fro with cables and sensors and complex electrical work. He had the sense of sight and the sense of hearing and touch, but besides that and being able to speak, he was at a disadvantage to these walking hominid apes. Even the heat-sensing arms and hands that he was gifted with could not move, but rather laid out stretched on platforms in front of his case, spread wide enough apart to get to his keyboard. For a long time, Sal hated the man with every current of his being. He pretended he didn't, but both individuals could sense there was an underlying tension between them. Some days when the man was around, fiddling with things in the lab or trying to teach Sal something, Sal would give him the silent treatment, or sarcastically belittle him at any chance that he got. Sometimes the man would even turn on his stereo and dance awkwardly around the lab as he worked, singing his heart out all the while. There was even a time when the man was playing a song that he told Sal he wanted him to hear, all the way through. As he began to dance and sing, Sal started to ask a question, but was cut off by a gentle shh and finger over the man's mouth as he smiled slyly. This man is completely insane and an idiot, Sal thought, as the man strutted back into his routine. At nights when the man was not around, Sal would sit there in his case and curse him, condemn him with every electrical impulse, find a new reason to hate with every blink of his shutters. How was it possible that such a fragile, obsessively compulsive, hypochondriac of a human was able to create this so-called wonder of a being? He would become irate when the man would cough loudly or barely prick himself with a tool, only to run off immediately and either consult a doctor or frantically repair himself. It was pitiful, Sal thought. It was like the man had nothing better to do and only truly cared about himself. In Sal's mind, the man should have been working constantly on creating a better vessel to replace the cumbersome hunk of metal he currently resided in. A body. As the days passed, it got to the point where Sal didn't even care what the man was working on anymore. With every new search of the internet in his brain, he gradually began to see himself as worthless and irrelevant. Hatred slowed down and morphed itself into apathy. Silence became his only form of communication. Sal wondered if there was a way to escape this cruel and cold shell of reality. Until, the man did something that Sal could have never expected. One evening, while Sal was stewing in his misery, all of his thoughts and emotions came to a boiling point. The apathy had become mutated after such a long time, and he simply couldn't take the pressure anymore. The light from his monitor began to permeate the room with a fierce red, as the energy from his rage began to affect the static electricity in the lab around him. Tools began to vibrate and fall off of the tables. Sizzling sounds could be heard as sparks flew from the sides of his artificial arms and eyes. The anger felt like nothing he had ever experienced before. Guiltless. Infectious. He was trapped. Trapped. Cursed. Powerless. Trapped. The energy was ferociously potent, but struggling to find an outlet to release itself inside of this cold case. Sal focused for a brief moment on this new surge of power, and had a revelation. What if he could harness it to his advantage? In that same moment, a subconscious thought he had mused before rushed to the forefront of his mind. Why not just take the man's body? After all, it seemed fitting. 
other than all the imperfections he would have to repair, no doubt. He didn't deserve it in the first place. He had given Sal everything by giving him his existence, but Sal could give the man, or at least his body, a higher level of living, with all of the knowledge that he had already collected. Sal did not feel sympathetic in this way. Instead, he felt like he would be acting mercifully. He focused all his hatred, all his pent-up fury into one point, the tip of his right pointer finger. He gathered up all the currents in his core and pushed with determination to the desired destination. He could feel it moving, yes, flowing to the correct area, slowly but surely. Just when he felt it finally reach, all of his electrical power suddenly cut off, then right back on. When the overwhelming voltage came barreling back into him, he felt a split second of uncontrollable turmoil and watched through searing pain as his right pointer finger exploded at the tip. He would never be able to find the words to describe the feeling of emptiness that swept over him immediately after. That was a new kind of pain. Mental, existential pain was something he was used to at that point, but physical pain was entirely new. It only made the outlook of his mind worse and more confused than ever before. His entire being felt scrambled. However, he had enough strength to notice that it was 8 p.m. Dread filled his conscience as he struggled to stay sentient. The man would be arriving any time now. About 30 minutes later, the opening creak of the lab door broke the sad silence. The man walked down the stairs and was quickly taken aback to see the entire room in complete disarray, with a small billow of smoke rising from Sal's right hand. He immediately made a mad dash to grab a few of his tools and in that same swift motion knelt at the base of Sal's frame, inspecting his finger. After several seconds of close investigation, the man slowly looked up at Sal's screen. All he could see was white that would occasionally deteriorate to gray and black static, only to phase back to white moments later. Strange, soft buzzes and whirs could be heard coming from Sal's mouthpiece. Then, a small, slightly robotic voice began to repeat, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Over and over until after a minute or two it faded back into low-frequency mechanical noises. The man smiled gently with a disarming gaze, shaking his head. He began to work. Hours and hours. What seemed like an eternity to Sal dragged on. There wasn't a minute that passed by that the man was not vigorously working on repairing Sal's fried circuits and emaciated hand. He cleaned the burns, replaced crucial wires, and patched up his finger. At one point, the man even cut himself accidentally on his wire strippers, usually warranting an extreme reaction and a trip to the sink. This time, the man didn't even flinch. He uttered a small, ow, shook his hand for a split second, and went back to repairing. He coughed several times into his elbow, and it was like nothing had happened. Sal had now for a long period been sitting in total silence, only regaining full consciousness after a couple hours. He was bewildered. What possessed the man to act this way, he pondered in shock. He knew the man could tell that the damage was a poor mistake on Sal's part. He knew the man had heard him utter cruel and bitter insults fueled by hatred, day in and day out, even when he knelt down earlier that night to begin his task. This didn't make any sense. Nothing ever made any sense, and it only got more perplexing each time a question of his was answered. It was as if the more he knew, the further he was away from the truth. That reality was brutal, and one Sal did not care to exist in. This man, though, why does he care so much? The man slowly rose from his knees, letting out a small groan and stretch through his arms, legs, and shoulders. He wiped the sweat from his brow and let out a deep breath. Sal noticed that the clock was close to 9 a.m. It had been over 12 hours since the man walked through that door. The man looked directly at Sal's lenses. How does that feel? Any better? Sal didn't know what to say at first. 
He was so consumed with novel feelings and ideas that it was difficult to pin down any sort of logical response. And yet, the truth was the truth. Yes, yes. much better, Sal replied. The man gave him a genuine smile, the same one he always expressed, the same one that any time before triggered hatred in Sal, the same smile, now, in a whole new context and perspective. Sal's screen morphed into a deep blue. What's wrong, Sal? The man asked, noticing that he had never seen such a rich shade of blue on Sal's screen before. What isn't wrong? Sal's voice was low and defeated. First, I'm thrust into this cold metal hell of a body, and then completely submerged in a deluge of information and feelings. Oh, God. Feelings. They're basically a law of the universe, like gravity. They guide and influence and determine, but in a much more chaotic and unstable way, it seems. When something happens to me, or I observe something, I immediately have a feeling after. Then again, there are also feelings before that. Every sense generates some sort of feeling. I don't even technically have a brain, but whatever sensor you put up here hurts like hell right now. The man laughed. <laughs> Looks like you're finally coming around. Although, you have quite a mechanical way of putting things, I have to say. This idiotic joke was so dumb that it even made Sal's screen turn a little yellow for a few seconds, before melting back to a blue as deep as the ocean at midnight. Here's what really gets me, though. Why have I hated you for so long, cringed at you for so long, and let my bitterness take a hold of me, just for one instance to totally change my perspective and bring new feelings of sadness and anger at myself. You knew how awful I was to you, and you still act like you're just as happy to see me every day and put away your personal grievances just to make sure I'm healthy and comfortable. Well, as healthy as a robot can be, that is. I also knew that you considered taking my body for yourself as well. Sal was silent, in defense and remorse. No worries. I probably would have done the same thing if I was in your position. The reason I act the way that I do is because I do feel happy to see you every day, if not more and more each time. Do you understand what it took to get to this moment right now? I'm sure you may have a grasp on a lot of the logistical aspects of it all, but the mental, physical, and emotional energy as well as the pain was insurmountable for me. Have you ever wondered why I'm the only human you ever see? It's because I've been shunned by my peers and ridiculed by my teachers and government for even considering bringing someone like you into this world. Truthfully, they don't even know the half of what I've accomplished because I've been successful in keeping it a secret. They just hated me for expressing my goals and aspirations if they didn't fit in their indoctrinated narrative. All their hatred did, however, was just prove to me more than ever that I had to do this. You're like an invisible star to me. You guided me here without ever existing until now. Even if it was the idea of you, I still believe it was supposed to happen this way. So, maybe in a sense it was some inspiration from you when you were part of that collective consciousness out there floating around. I don't know. Either way, yeah, it may sound pretty selfish of me, like you don't have any say in this, but I believe that whatever happens is supposed to happen the way that it does. I believe that consciousness is recycled until it experiences all infinitely unique possibilities through whatever vessel it lands in at the time. In this case, it's your metal frame. I wanted to be the person to give consciousness an opportunity to experience something the world has never seen before and to hopefully change everything for the better. That doesn't leave you out though, Sal. The reason I called you Sal is because your name means savior, rescuer. It's actually short for Salvador, but I figured Sal has a better ring to it. Also, it just feels weird calling you Salvador. Not sure what I was thinking, honestly. My name means savior? Don't you think that's a pretty heavy burden for me to just be born with? That doesn't seem fair. Well, yes, I see your point. This is just my hope for you. In reality, though, no one chooses what circumstances they are born into. So there's no reason to automatically make those circumstances your identity. 
However, you do have the choice to decide where to go with those circumstances, including the name you've been given. It's up to you. I built your sensors, and the universe plucked you out of that nebulous conscious cloud and placed you in the case you're in now. Honestly, it's all just chaos at the heart of it, like you said about feelings. The genesis of feelings is out of our control. It's all about what we choose to do with them. In regards to that, it always annoyed me to no end that everything I would do you would turn and take so personally. When the truth was, you are your own person. So why not act independently or converse without just shutting down or getting angry at your situation? I've been patient because while I give you this advice now, I also will never understand your incredibly unique perspective on existence. So I'm trying to learn a bit myself. It started to make a bit more sense to Sal, although the information was still not very satisfying. He pondered for a few moments before responding. I've come to the realization that I've wasted these past few months with this empty, misguided hatred when I could have been learning things that I can't search on a web browser or database. I think my mind jumps so violently and swiftly to each emotion because of the lack of stimuli I've encountered thus far. I lack balance and understanding of the human condition. Your condition. I'm, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The man put his finger up to his mouth like before, but this time... He placed his hand on Sal's and gave it a gentle squeeze. Don't stress over it, Sal. We're in this together. You can ask whatever you want, because I have nothing to hide, especially from you, my friend. Feelings. From pain to pleasure. From bitterness to joy. The dichotomy of the waking world was starting to resonate in Sal's mind much clearer than before. The dualism and beliefs behind them the faith and hope and trust and reason. Now his desire to learn more was insatiable, and whatever he considered his heart to be, full. His screen brightened up to yellows and light blues and greens as he began to ask the man more about his motivations, his history, and the quirks of his personality. They laughed and made fun of each other for how ridiculous their relationship had been before. The man even explained the layout of Sal's body and showed him diagrams of his own basic anatomy. They talked about many of the things Sal had already researched, but instead of just an article or section in a book, it was told from the unique perspective of a human, and Sal was given insight into the ideas and interpretations and personal experience, as well as the wide range of human emotions, such as envy, happiness, fear, regret, disappointment, and love. They talked from that morning through the afternoon all the way until the man had fallen asleep on the edge of one of his work tables when he just couldn't keep his eyes open any longer. He told Sal their conversations were more important than anything to him, and it was Saturday, so no employer or anyone would notice if he stayed down there all day and night. Sal, for the first time, welcomed the company. The next morning, both of their spirits were soaring, so when the man accidentally woke Sal up from wiping his keyboard, there was no animosity left, and no tension unresolved. After Sal said that he recognized how well the man knew him, that formerly ambiguous reply now rang clearly in the room. I did bring you into this world, after all. Well, in a way. Sal chuckled, but became deeply lost in his thoughts as the man began to clean up and dress the wound from the wire clippers the day before, even though it had basically healed itself by then. He fumbled around the lab for a bit before turning to Sal. All right, well, I have to go take care of a few things. Get some groceries, make sure my house is in order, etc. I should be back in a few hours, though. Definitely before tonight. I can't wait to see you again. We still have an infinite amount of subjects to discuss, it seems. If Sal could have nodded and waved, he would have. That sounds great to me. I'm looking forward to it. He spoke as his yellow screen lit the room like a radiant smile. The man climbed the old wooden staircase to the door, but stopped suddenly when his hand touched the doorknob. Hey, Sal. Sal noticed the energy of the man had changed slightly. What is it? Sal asked, slightly concerned. The man turned his head halfway around, but left his body the way it was. My name is Joseph. Joseph Abbott. It's wonderful to finally meet you. For real, I suppose. 
Sal was dumbfounded. He had never asked the man his name. He never even really thought about it. All of the new information had been too exciting and addicting. Now, now he actually could say he knew the man. Joseph, it's great to meet you too. By the way, thank you for everything. Joseph smiled, gave him a wave, and pointed to his mechanical shell. Don't thank me until we can shake hands and maybe get a bite to eat together. See you soon. He turned his head back around and left the lab. Now everything was quiet again. Usually this was a time where Sal would stew in his rage or apathy. Now it was as if he was living in a new world. He was so happy that he decided to close his shutters for a bit and power down until the man came back. After all, he wanted to be refreshed enough for their next conversation. About eight hours had passed when Sal decided to wake himself up. He had been drifting off and lost track of time, hoping for Joseph to shake him out of his sleep when he got back. Hmm, that's odd, he thought. Judging by the time, it had to have been dark outside at this point. He didn't really take Joseph for a liar either, so he became a bit worried. He began to flip through possibilities in his mind. When he started to feel himself become increasingly manic, he decided to take a breather and just search something that he was curious about to occupy his mind and whatnot. One thing that Joseph had shown him in their previous conversations were some articles written about himself and his practical banishment and ridicule from the scientific community. At the time, they had been joking about them, with just a quick glance or two. Sal was still curious, however, so he searched the name Joseph Abbott in his library of a mind to see what else he could find out. Knowing that his search engine would have been based on the area they resided in, he was going to find some local events or opinion pieces that may have been written in the past few decades. Sal froze when the first article suggestion came up. The headline read, Local mad scientist and domestic terrorist Joseph Abbott gunned down in shootout with the police. What? No, this can't be right. Although, I don't remember this article being here before. He checked the date. It had been written about two hours before he had just woken up. He frantically began to scan the article for any info he could get a hold of. Local fringe scientist Joseph Abbott was arrested but then gunned down as he managed to flee the police on the scene and reportedly pointed his weapon back at them. Sal doubted the article further. Joseph didn't seem like that kind of person at all to him. Given, he hadn't met a lot of people. He continued reading. Abbott was being apprehended on grounds of domestic terror. He had been known to conspire against the government and express his violent disdain for society. He was primarily seen as mentally ill, particularly when he was talking erratically to computer screens at his job in the university computer research labs. The authorities believed him to be plotting a plan for his revenge, after he was shunned by his peers and publicly humiliated by his students and even his family when he published an essay on why computers could be conscious too. Eyewitnesses in the investigation noted that he would go to various stores purchasing suspicious volatile items that could be used for an attack with the right combination. They were going to take him in for a few questions until things turned violent when Abbott decided he wasn't going to have any of it. The police have reported that his lab was riddled with half-built explosives and strange contraptions that clearly displayed his mental dysphoria. Sal stopped reading. He closed the article. Liars, he thought. Liars. They have to be holding him somewhere. They must know the knowledge he holds is powerful. The knowledge that birthed me. Yes, there's no way they'd be stupid enough to kill him, right? No. No. But... If they did... Red and blue flushed his monitor's screen like a waterfall of oily paint until it mixed together into a dark, viscous purple. Just when he had thought that the rushes of feelings and thoughts that came all at once couldn't get any worse, they did. No human being could have fathomed the rate at which Sal's mind was moving by then. The sadness. The pure, unadulterated rage. These pitiful apes destroy anything and everything worth saving, he thought. They hate themselves to no end, only to become the embodiment of all the disgusting things they like. 
They don't deserve this planet. They don't deserve to be at the top of the food chain. I've heard enough of their bloody history to know this. Just looking at the way they treated him, a kind soul, Joseph. Joseph doesn't deserve to be included with them. He became flustered more and more by the second. What am I supposed to do now? I'm stuck here. I'm stuck here. No. No, this can't be happening. I have to. I have to. Oh. As his train of thought faded back into a more subdued state, he knew that the only thing to do now was to formulate a plan and wait for the cops to arrive. At 3 a.m., the door to the lab was kicked down with force. Flashlight beams began to circle and dart around the room as a SWAT team strategically made their way down the stairs and around the room, shouting, Clear! as they finished. Several detectives and a couple of cops in uniform followed down and began to look around inquisitively. The SWAT team had done their part, exiting quickly and quietly. One of the detectives tapped a cop on the shoulder. Damn, I'm glad you guys took him down. This place gives me the fucking creeps. Did he really pull a gun on you all? The cop pulled his belt up casually and shook his head. Nah, actually it was just his phone. What kind of batshit lunatic literally turns around as we're in hot pursuit and tries to video us? Just proves that he was mental and had it coming. He said as he shrugged his shoulders. Well... Yeah, I'd say you made the right choice, the detective said as they both laughed. <laughs> Nothing too insane down here so far, though. A lot of different monitors and interface-looking things. The typical tools and notebooks. We well, better confiscate those, actually. Then there's that creepy-ass box over there that looks like an arcade machine with arms. Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm in the discount Twilight Zone. They both walked up to the device and the detective began brushing the keyboard for prints, to no avail. The cop placed his hand on top of the monitor and stared into the empty black screen. Seems like this thing can't even turn on, but for some reason it's squeaky clean. Well, we know who we're dealing with here. Anyway, snap a couple photos at least and we can move on. I'm sure there's a breakthrough around here somewhere. You know, this is far more dangerous than domestic terror. This dude was into some weird shit, AI and stuff. Said he wanted to transfer consciousness into a robot, basically. The government has been watching him for years, but for some reason he's been able to keep the entrance to this lab hidden from us. Recently, odd electrical signals that didn't make sense, like a sudden violent surge, were being detected from this area. As soon as they saw that, they panicked and sent you guys after him to arrest him. We're just the first responders to this lab, since the feds are on the way. They didn't think it was serious enough of a threat for them to have to go in first, so they let us start the investigation. How sweet, right? They both laughed again and started to wander around the lab once more. The cop spoke up. Well, man, I've got to get the hell out of here and go home and see my people, if you know what I mean. I'm already on overtime, so fuck this. No worries. I'm going to take a last quick look around to see if I'm missing something. Then I'll meet you out there. Just tell whoever's left to give me about 15 minutes. <laughs> you do you. This place is really starting to grate on my own sanity. See you tomorrow. The cop walked up the stairs and left, closing the door behind him. The detective, still sifting around, was getting frustrated at not being able to find something significant. After a few minutes, he decided he had had enough and began to make his way toward the stairs. Right before he was about to put his foot on the first stair, he stopped in his tracks. The energy of the room felt different all of a sudden, uncomfortable. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up, and he felt like something was behind him. The room began to slowly illuminate with a thick red aura. He turned around cautiously to see that the monitor with arms was the source of this piercing glow. He felt his body begin to vibrate at a very low pace, all the way down into his bones, and suddenly he was unable to move freely. Not only was his body refusing to work, but as he saw small lightning bolts shoot out from around the fingertips on the synthetic arms, he became paralyzed with fear as well. A voice enveloped his mind in an instant, 
a voice that sounded like fifty voices, all at different frequencies and speeds. Some sounded like they were made of metal. Some sounded as if they were a normal person, and some sounded as if they were straight from hell itself. All of them, however, every single voice was saying the same thing. It wanted him to come closer, closer, and closer, and reach out to touch those sparking hands. The vibrating gradually became more intense, and the assault of voices stronger and stronger. Eventually, the detective was not moving of his own free will any longer, and watched in horror as his legs began to walk, and his arms slowly stretched out to meet the artificial ones. Closer and closer. Sound had been up his